Hey there folks, how's it going? This week was an interesting week. I uh, finished teaching my section of the permaculture design course, which is chapter 14. And if you've ever taken a PDC, you know chapter 14 is all about the invisible structures that us humans depend upon. Community, money, uh, how we organize, how we make our living, how we exchange with each other, and all those systems that are easy to overlook. When people first start looking into self-reliance, growing their own food, getting off the grid, finding ways, alternative ways to heat and power their houses, um, those are all relatively easy things to figure out. I mean, they have their complexities, they have their nuances, and it's not without its challenges, but these ideas are all over the internet. And you can find how-to guides on how to set all of these things up. And our permaculture design course deals with a whole bunch of these things. What really shocks people is when they get to the end of the course and they've got to do a design uh, is how possible that design actually is. Uh, if you follow the steps in the permaculture design manual and you kind of go through it one by one with a group of people, you can figure it out. And the, the act of figuring it out uh, actually cements the, um, the knowledge in your head. And then you got to give a presentation and the presentation cements it even further. But the piece that always shocks people the most in these courses is when we get into talking about chapter 14. So this week uh, we did our usual chapter 14 review. And we ask people to watch a movie called Money as Debt, which is free on YouTube. And I recommend that you watch it if you haven't already done it. And it explains how our current money system works. So money is defined as uh, a unit of account, a medium of exchange, and a store of value. That's the, you know, Wikipedia definition of it. However, Bernard Leotard, who is the architect of the Euro, who claims that that was the worst thing that he ever did in his life, uh, has spent the rest of his life trying to help people understand how money works, as well as how complementary currencies can be created in order to solve complex Gordian knots. And he describes money quite simply as an agreement. And I, I'll leave a link to his TED talk in the show notes down below, because I think it's a really important TED talk. I think if you can read between the lines and understand what he's trying to say, I think you'll see how important it is to understand why currency and money is important. Um, and so this week's kind of state of the world, uh, or my vlog of the week, I guess, whatever we want to call this video, is all about money and debt and how we organize ourselves as permaculturists, no matter where you are in the world. Now, as I delivered chapter 14, and we ended up discussing all of these things in class, um, it got me thinking about what Michelle and I were going to do in our community here, how we were going to start to organize a complementary currency around the community that we live in. Now, if you're following the news at all, which I hope you're not, but if you are, then you'll see that Argentina currently has an inflation rate of 95%. That's crazy. That means that something that cost a dollar last year is going to cost a dollar and ninety-five this year, which ostensibly means that your money in your bank account is worth half as much this year as it was last year. And it seems no matter where you look in the world, inflation is kind of wreaking havoc in all of the economic systems, all the financial systems of the world. And it makes me wonder, like, what would happen if that came to Canada? If that came to the U.S. There is historic precedence that this has happened in the past. And what people should think about when they read articles like this is how to prepare, how to make sure that the effort that you're putting into your job or um, into your business is not going to be eroded by these monstrous inflationary pressures. And so obviously there's different investment strategies and we could spend a whole video talking about those. There's precious metals. So precious metals traditionally have been useful at uh, 
maintaining value. I think the rule of thumb for gold is that no matter which age in human history you go to, an ounce of gold is, will always be able to, or always has been able to buy a high-end suit. So back in Greek times, one ounce would buy you a suit. And if you think about the cost of an ounce of gold today, um, it's probably, I don't know what it is today, but 1900 bucks, $2,000, somewhere in that range, will buy you a decent suit. Um, however, if you also look into the history of gold, you'll know that there have been times in history when the governments have taken that gold away. They've made it illegal to own that gold. And so you can hedge your bets with silver and gold and platinum. You can uh, buy crypto. That's another hedge. Um, you can buy farmland. You can invest in skills. All of these things are options that can potentially help see you through an inflationary period of time. Now, the other thing that I'm reminded of from the presentation that I gave this week was the sheer volume of debt that was created since 2008. And so I'll share a graphic right now that shows a, basically a series of bubble diagrams um, of all of the different countries, all of the major G8 countries, I believe, and the amount of debt that they had in 2008 after the 2008 crisis and the debt levels that were created as a result of the COVID spending. And you can see that the volumetric increase in cash from 2008, which was a really big deal, 2008 was when we had all the quantitative easing, when the, the banks basically printed massive, massive amounts of money. The amount of money that was printed over COVID eclipses the amount of money that was printed in order to solve the last financial crisis. And so a logical person should think like what happens when this technique mathematically doesn't work anymore because all of the debt that's created in these systems um, is just principal. They don't actually create the interest that is accrued as a result of the debt that gets created. If you don't understand what I'm saying there, then watch Money as Debt. It's in the show notes down below and you'll understand what I mean. So at some point, the amount of debt uh, generates so much interest that the system will have to implode. And nobody really knows when that's going to happen. Uh, how many more rabbits can they pull out of their magic hats? We don't know. But uh, a logical person would wonder, what else can I do in order to ensure that if we end up in a complete financial meltdown, if the bank machines stop operating, if inflation gets to levels that was seen in Zimbabwe and the Weimar Republic, um, what does an individual do? And so here's what we're doing. We have an incredible community and uh, incredible communities don't just come out of thin air. They need work. You need to invest into them. You need to create relationships. And so when, when we moved to where we are right now, we joined the local community hall board and we got to know as many of the neighbors as possible. And that's been really great. We're going to start a monthly cafe at our local community hall and we're going to start inviting our community members, our neighbors, to start showing up and having coffee. No real expectations other than just getting to know them. My intention, though, is to start understanding their skills, what kind of resources they have, what they're interested in, where they're located, starting to build almost a skill inventory of the folks around me. I want to know what people are good at around me, essentially. Um, I'm, I'm a connector. I'm one of those people that uh, has a really good memory and I remember what people do and what they're good at and what they're interested in. And if you know me or you've known me for a while, you'll know that I'm constantly making connections from one person to another. That's just my, my talent, my skill. That's my passion. And so I'm going to start deploying my brain to start creating those connections within my community more than I've already done. Now, the other thing that I did after teaching this week, um, one of the best ways to learn is actually to teach. And so every time I teach a section of the PDC, I learn something, I get an insight. It's kind of crazy how that works. And so I did a bit of research after watching Bernard Leotard's video again, uh, which I'll leave in the show notes down below. And I found a, an app that uh, can be used as a point of sale service for a regular business. But uh, the app itself can also be used as a local energy transfer system. So let's is what they're referred to. 
is a way of creating a complementary currency within a small group of individuals, typically 150 to 200 people within a community. So you could extend that out a little bit and say between 150 and 200 families, let's say. So the number of people will end up being a little bit bigger, but um, you know, if we think of things in terms of families or family units within this region, it'll be more than 200 people, but roughly 150 to 200 accounts. Now, the software doesn't limit the number of people. That 150 is a limit that uh, Malcolm Gladwell suggests is a stable number for a community of individuals because 150 is about the number of people that you can keep resident in your mind. Now, assuming that each one of these individuals that's part of this let system has a skill or resource that they want to sell, then you've got an economy. Now, what's interesting about let systems and what makes it different than bartering, bartering assumes that two people can come to a trade that's mutually beneficial. So if I grow cucumbers and you grow beef and we both each of us, like you really like cucumbers and I really like beef, then we've got a good way of trading my cucumbers for your beef. Now, if I happen to be uh, of a religion that doesn't eat beef and you really want my cucumbers, we have a problem. We can't come to a trade that's mutually beneficial. However, if there's an intermediary currency, like uh, an intermediate currency between the two of us, that's also shared between 150 other people, then as long as we have trust in that currency, then you can buy my cucumbers, but I don't have to buy your beef. And so it facilitates an efficient exchange of goods and services. Um, it, you know, in the event that you can't come up with a good bartering arrangement between the two parties. And so that's the the value of currency. Now, right now we have trust in the Canadian or the US dollar or the Euro. Uh, and we know that lots of other vendors in our country are going to accept that currency. So it doesn't matter um, if I just give you money for your beef or you give me money for my cucumbers. But in the event that that currency stops operating because it is a monoculture and monocultures are fragile and subject to all of these other things that are discussed in these videos that I've put in the show notes down below, we have a problem. And so the minute you don't have any money and then people don't have a very efficient way of exchanging. And so a complementary currency uh, facilitates that efficient exchange and it creates a polyculture of currencies such that if the Canadian dollar or the US dollar stops functioning, we have a parallel system to move into rapidly. Now, the difference between a let system and a fiat system, fiat being the predominant currency system of the Western world right now, fiat means that there is value given to that currency by decree because the government says so. Uh, fiat currencies are functionally based upon uh, fractional reserve banking, meaning that all the money in the system is actually debt. So their promises, their IOUs, and also that when a bank lends money, it's not lending money based upon what's in deposit, but it creates new money out of thin air. And like I said earlier, that money is created, the principle's created, but the interest is not. So over time, as um, if the basically that system depends upon a growing economy, and if the economy doesn't continue to grow, then uh, the lack of growth means that there's not enough new value generation, new money, new debt being created in order to pay the interest on previous loans. So from a macro perspective, the system implodes. Now, coming back to let systems, let systems are not based upon debt. They're not based upon fractional reserve banking. And in fact, everybody within a let's economy, so let's say that you have a community and there's 150 people in there and they're all registered in your let system, and let's call that dollar the um, the pigeon pigeon coin. Um, and so, as long as all you've got 150 people in that let system, and they're all functionally using this pigeon coin, the goal in a let system is that everybody wants to try and get back to zero. So everybody starts at zero dollars, and the goal is always to get to zero dollars. And so now, if I go and buy your beef, and let's say that it costs me 500 pigeons. That will put my let's balance to minus 500 pigeons. Okay, so I have a negative balance on my account. And then I go and sell my cucumbers to somebody else and they go buy a whole bunch of my cucumbers, maybe because they're doing a, uh, a pickling marathon. Uh, maybe they buy 300 pigeons worth of my cucumbers. 
Now my balance is negative 200. And maybe I sell some more cucumbers uh, to somebody else and I sell, you know, another 300 pigeons worth of cucumbers. Now I have a positive balance of 100 pigeons in my account. Now in a let system, the community will set a, a maximum positive balance and a maximum negative balance so that if somebody is just constantly buying and they're not selling, then the system kind of breaks down because if you're constantly buying from people, and you're creating really, really large negative balances, uh, then you'll undermine the system because you're not actually contributing value back into the system. And so the goal is to, to be spending within the economy, but also to be producing and to sell into the economy as well. And over time, what happens is your balances will basically pop negative and positive depending upon the kind of trading that you're doing. And if enough of those people within that community are adding and subtracting value, basically consuming and producing, then you end up with this vibrant community of people that are uh, actively using exchange. And what's really cool about that is that that value that is generated and exchanged amongst the people within that community stays within the community. So it's not getting siphoned off by big mega corporations. It's not being taxed. Although technically speaking, depending upon the tax laws of your uh, country, those let's dollars are subject to income tax. And so make sure you do your research with regards to how the tax laws in your country work. Um, but some countries may not tax that. It's going to depend upon where you live. And so now you've got this functional complementary parallel currency. It's not designed to replace the Canadian dollar or the US dollar. It's designed as a resilient opportunity to uh, create useful exchanges amongst your neighbors to have the efficiency of the currency, but the resilience of a second currency. Uh, and so it doesn't you know, preclude you from doing barter. It doesn't preclude you from using the Canadian dollar. It just provides another avenue of exchange. And it, over time, will facilitate an increase in trust. So I'm going to leave a link to this Cyclos um, app down below, and you can take a look at it. Ultimately, I think it'd be super cool to build a completely open source Let's app for both iOS and Android. You know, this is a good starting place. I don't think it's a good ending place. I think ideally a community should be able to host its own ledger, have its own data and not have it go up into the cloud somewhere for somebody to audit. Uh, and I think that that would be a, a, a mission for our little community at some point in the future. And maybe we'll do a Kickstarter or something. I think it would be really cool for us to have our own app, an open source app that is hosted on GitHub or is on the iOS and Android stores that facilitates the creation of uh, a server that can be hosted by the community if, if they so choose and facilitate um, ease of use uh, managing a small decentralized ledger that facilitates the transactions amongst community members. I think that'd be super cool. So I've written a blog about this. I'm going to leave a link to that blog in the show notes down below. I would love to hear about your thoughts on this matter, uh, about creating complementary currencies, about the inflation in Argentina, um, and how you're preparing yourself fiscally and financially uh, for all of the craziness that's going on in the world right now. Um, I definitely don't have all the answers. This is just some of my initial research that I've done, and I've been teaching this now for 14 years. Um, and I would love to know what you're doing for yourself, but also within your community to set yourself up so that you've got a parallel system to operate in should the primary system that you depend upon crumble. Hey folks, if you want more information on this, make sure you check out the blog, which is linked in the show notes down below. If you want that blog delivered to your inbox, I write on a regular basis. Uh, we send out newsletters. So head over to vergepermaculture.ca, sign up for our newsletter and uh, get up to date information on all that stuff. And if you're interested in a community of people that are talking about these things on a regular basis, the Verge Permaculture website now has a free community group where you can have uncensored conversations about currency, being off grid, growing your own food, um, you know, alternative heat and energy approaches, um, and generally a community of practitioners that are trying to figure out how to best move forward in a positive and productive way uh, for the future in spite of all the craziness that's happening in the world. Okay, guys, we'll see you in the next video. Said we're gonna grow a garden.